Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ERA EDTA e seminar uh, prepared by Diabetes Working Group with the short title Post Transplant Diabetes 2021. I'm moderating this seminar. I'm Draženka Pongratz Barlovic. I'm a diabetologist at the University Medical Center, Ljubljana, Slovenia. First, I would like to introduce you to our faculty. We have today with us as a speaker, a renowned professor of nephrology, Dr. Trond Geir Jensen. He's coming from Norway, from the Oslo University Hospital, where he leads a kidney transplant research group. He is the author of numerous research papers focused mainly on solid organ transplantation. Then we have two panelists. The first one is actually a neighbor to our speaker coming from Denmark, Professor Mats Hornung. He works as a consultant in nephrology at the Copenhagen University Hospital. He's also a very active researcher with his main research interest, I would say, being understanding the connection between metabolic and kidney disease pathways, and of course, transplantation. To introduce the other panelists, we have to move much more to the south, to Tenerife, Spain. So I warmly welcome Esteban Purini, a professor working at the University La Laguna, living in that exotic part of the world, could not prevent him from working tirelessly to find the ways for improving outcomes and lives of people with CKD. He is also the soul of the ERA EDTA working group Diabetes, trying to push forward the importance of metabolic factors in kidney disease. Okay, post transplant diabetes. Obviously, it is an important and a fast moving field generating a lot of opportunities, especially with novel treatments, but also a lot of questions. Before I pass the word to our speaker, I would like to warmly invite you in the audience to actively participate by typing the questions into the Zoom Q&A box. We are recording this session so it will be made available on various platforms afterwards. So we have a lot to cover in an hour. So without further ado, we should start with Professor Jensen. Please, Professor, if you can share your screen. Thank you, Dozenka. I will do that right away. And let me first start off by thanking the organizing committee for inviting me to to give my presentation on this topic, which is a sort of one of my favorite fields. Uh, this is uh, the slides I want to share it with you. So this is just a, a picture of my hospital, but the title was given to me, Post-Transplant Diabetes Mellitus 2021. Uh, to present you an updated situation of how it is with this condition in 2021, I have to give you sort of a, a retrospective review of what we have learned over the last few years and what we can expect to do in the near future. First of all, these are my disclosures, non particular. Besides, I have received honoraria from several companies that also produce uh, uh, drugs that we may use in our patients. From my perspective, the definition of PTDM is still the conservative one that we have been using for the last 20 years, uh, enforced actually by the consensus committee in 2014, that we rather want to use an OGDT as a diagnostic criterion for post-transplant diabetes mellitus. This held true also in the era 10 years ago when uh, one decided to make HbA1c the major uh, diagnostic criterion for type 2 diabetes. And I know we can discuss afterwards how this may be applicable in PTDM patients. What I can see right now is actually if you want to uh, 
if you want to diagnose PTDM before one year has, a, has a run a post-transplant, you probably will run into problem using the HbA1c criteria, but maybe that could be a valid one later on. We can discuss that afterwards. In my presentation, and at least in presenting our papers, uh, we define post-transplant diabetes mellitus according to the glucose criteria with OGDT. Now, PTDM is a condition that involves uh, elevated blood sugar hypoglycemia in almost all kinds of solid organ transplant patients. This is just a review that was published a year ago, and you can see from the columns here that uh, the conditions, the solid organ transplant conditions that most frequently will have PTDM on board will be uh, persons with liver transplants and lung transplants, with heart transplants somewhat in between. And to the right, this is just uh, uh, an overview of the present literature on uh, the prevalence or, or actually accumulated incidence of PTDM in kidney transplant recipients. It is our experience in Norway and also probably other places, at least in Europe, that the incidence is sort of decreasing over the last 10, 20 years. Back in 2005, we reported that we have an accumulated incidence of PTDM over the first 10 weeks post-transplant of 20% with PTDM. Whereas nowadays, this has been reduced to less than 10% actually. And we believe this is partly due to less use of steroids because we have less rejections going on because of more efficient immunosuppressive therapy in the patients. But this may vary at different centers, not only according to the, the vintage, the time that it, the studies were done, but also to the diagnostic criterions that, criteria that would use. So we, some would use only treated diabetes as a PTDM diagnosis criterion, whereas other would use an OGDT. So the criterions may vary between the centers. We learned very early that the PTDM and even post-transplant IGT impaired glucose tolerance involved a particular mortality risk for the patients, the renal transplant patients. And even our surgeons actually got interested in this condition because they realized that they were losing patients if they develop PTDM or even IGT. Uh, we did this study back, this is data going back from the early days in this uh, the millennium actually. So this is data from between 2000 to 2010. Now, later on, we have learned that most of these patients actually die from cardiovascular disease, but other diseases may evolve too. There is a mortality risk, not only in renal transplant patients, but also in heart transplant patients and in lung transplant patients. And in liver transplant patients, there is also a major cardiovascular risk in patients with either PTDM or, or uh, uh, transit PTDM. So all in all, this is a common problem in all solid organ transplantations that patients are at risk for developing hyperglycemia and even diabetes that we call PTDM. Now, I said there is a cardiovascular risk involved with the mortality and even in prediabetes, what we call prediabetes, impaired glucose tolerance or even impaired fasting glucose, it is a, a cardiovascular risk, uh, a risk for cardiovascular events. This is a study that you all know from Spain as the Bumperini and co-workers published in Kidney International back in 2019. So if you follow the patients for a medium of, medium of maybe eight years, but you do, they did actually several repeated OGDTs over the first five years to assure that the status of prediabetes or PTDM was the correct one. Uh, you can see that the PTDM curve is the one that you see in yellow here, but you see almost a similar risk of cardiovascular events in those with prediabetes. So prediabetes is almost the same cardiovascular risk in, in renal transplant patients as is PTDM. And that makes sense because we have just made labels how to understand diabetes versus no diabetes. There's no particular reason that certain glucose levels thresholds should ascertain the patient's risk. This is a continuum of risk, which we can study by certain ranges of hyperglycemia. Uh, 
prediabetes, IGT being one of them, PTDM being the more extreme uh, variant of hypoglycemia. We have studied or thought of maybe there are other reasons for increased mortality in, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in PTDM. And uh, there are not very many studies studying this. Most of them have actually studied only total mortality or, or, maybe, or maybe just cardiovascular uh, events. Now, this is one from, this is a smaller study from Cleveland, Ohio in the States. Uh, they started off with all, more than 200 kidney transplant patients, but they made a case control study with 47 of these kidney uh, transplant patients with PTM compared to a similar person without PTDM. And what they could see was that mortality was sort of tended to increase, but there was a significant difference in, in, in infections actually in those with PTDM versus the case that they were matched with. There was also, of course, a difference in CVD, cardiovascular disease, and even in rejections in this particular study. We had one publication back in 2016, looking at more than 1,600 kidney transplanted patients. And you can see that uh, 1,400 of these were without PTDM after 10 weeks of follow-up, but some of them had developed hyperglycemia that needed oral agent or maybe insulin over the first 10 weeks and some were actually only diagnosed by an OGDT after 10 weeks post-transplant. And of course if we adjust for some of the risk factors for CVD or cardiovascular events uh, it may be tough to show any significance in such a small number of patients. In unadjusted numbers you could see there was significant risk for cardiovascular uh, mortality uh, in, in both those who, who actually uh, evolved diabetes before the oral glucose tolerance test or those with a milder diabetes that only was diagnosed with the oral glucose tolerance test. And it was even significant in the first group with multiple adjustments for those uh, components I mentioned below. As for infections, there was actually also a tendency that there was a mortality over uh, and uh, an overweight of mortality along among those with manifest PTDM over the first 10 weeks. These were followed for a median of seven years. I forgot to tell you that the diagnosis of, was made. Ten, the diagnosis of diabetes was made 10 weeks after transplantation, but they were followed thereafter for a median of seven years. And as you can see here in unadjusted uh, uh, calculations, there was an increased risk of dying for, 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 from infections in both groups of PTDMs, uh, but this was sort of canceled if you adjusted for all the other risk factors. There was no increased risk in this small study on, on cancer mortality in these patients. This is a well-known pie chart that you all know from before. Uh, what factors, risk factors may implement, be implemented in the risk of developing PTDM? Some are not modifiable, those are to the left. Some are modifiable, those are those to the right. And some are some between with viral infections. And somebody I've also made studies if low magnesium levels after transplantation can contribute to diabetes. That, however, is not an established fact yet. It's only a slight hypothesis. The major part that we have been discussing over the years is the role of the immunosuppressant agents. But we know also that there are risk factors for development of PTDM that is similar to the risk factors that you see for development of type 2 diabetes. And these factors probably work in concert with each other. Now back again to Spain, where they did this repeated OGDT study measurements over five years to look at new cases of PTDM. These are the new cases at three months, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months after transportation. And to the right, you see the accumulated incidence over the time line here. And you can appreciate that this is a bi biphasic curve. And we may speculate what is the reason for this biphasic curve. If you remember what we said in the last slide, there are 
risk factors related to immunosuppressive therapy. There are also risk factors relating to more common type 2 diabetes risk factors. And maybe the overweight or high doses of immunosuppressive agents in the first, uh, first few months after transplantation may be partly uh, responsible for this first surge in PTDM cases, which sort of tapers off before a new search level sort of takes off later on. And this may be partly due to other risk factors when the immunosuppressive agents have been tapered off. We don't know this exactly, but it's a very reasonable um, hypothesis and statement to make actually that this is quite likely that what happens. What we haven't studied so much in PTDM is the gene material, the gene risk that we have. These are extensively studied in type 2 diabetes, and there are multiple genes being associated with the risk of development of type 2 diabetes, but none of them have really big impact in, in certain, by themselves. These are SNPs with so, so small impact on type 2 diabetes, maybe increase the risk by half a percent for each of them. If you sum them up together, maybe you have a, quite a package of, 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 of uh, risky genes or SNPs to make type 2 diabetes, the, the map is very much not drawn for type for PTDM. And we do not know actually if the, the genetic disposition for developing PTDM is the same genetic predisposition for developing type 2 diabetes. But some of these SNPs that have been investigated look very similar to what you see in type 2 diabetes, but this is a very uh, undrawn map Actually, what we do need and we don't have yet is large GIVA studies to look at the genetic component of the risk of developing PTDM. And especially if this genetic map looks pretty much like type 2 diabetes. We don't have this data yet, but I, am, I have seen uh, some, some uh, signals that we may re get or at least a couple of those studies during the next few months. So that will be exciting to see more about the GIVA studies for the risk of developing PTDM. There is a sort of a review that you can look up uh, that I have cited below on this picture. Now back to the drugs then. Uh, we know that both corticosteroids, the calcineurin inhibitors, sacrolimus and cyclosporin, and maybe also mTOR inhibitors predisposed to high blood sugars in predisposed patients. Maybe it's such a case that if you have the predisposed patients here, maybe with some genetic material predisposing to diabetes in general, and they undergo a kidney or heart transplantation or a solid organ transplantation in general, a high load of these immunosuppressive drugs will sort of unmask a diabetic situation. This is just the drawing from multiple studies that have been published that we put into a review. And what it basically says is that the prednisolone that we use actually in pretty small doses predisposes to more or less insulin resistance, both in the liver, in the adipose tissue, and in the muscle. You need to have very high doses of glucocorticosteroids to impair the beta cells. Whereas the calcineurin inhibitors, especially tacrolimus, uh, sort of inhibit uh, the cell proliferation and also the beta cell action and insulin release. And this is sort of confounded also if you have a lipotoxicity just, uh, uh, at present at the same time. That together with acrolimus is especially detrimental to the beta cell. To begin with, one thought that mTOR inhibitors were sort of innocent in these pictures, but now we know better. We have good data saying that the mTOR inhibitors may even induce apoptosis and less cell proliferation for the beta cells, and they may also, the mTOR inhibitors may also impair insulin sensitivity in the liver. On top of that, the mTOR inhibitors may actually also provoke release of free fatty acid from adipose tissue, which sort of works back on the beta cell and is very, very detrimental for the beta cell together with, for instance, tacrolimus action. So this is basically the picture that we have. We have several immunosuppressive agents that work detrimentally both on insulin sensitivity and beta cell function. So what we have to do is sort of try to make the best out of it. 
steroid withdrawal have been tried. It doesn't really work. This is a study by Perch and co-workers. Uh, more than 200 patients randomized to early steroid withdrawal versus continuation of glucocorticosteroids in renal transplant patients. They have used several diagnostic criteria for PTDM, and it doesn't work in terms of statistics. So these drug, these uh, these lines are actually statistically the same between those who continued with small doses of prednisolone and those who withdrew it after one week uh, after transplantation. So steroid withdrawal by itself does not prevent development of PTDM. We did in the old days an old study saying that if you taper this prednisolone dose down to five milligrams a day, that would sort of improve the insulin sensitivity. And this was determined by hyper insulinemic euglycemic clamp techniques. Uh, but once you got below five milligrams a day down to zero, tape or withdrawal, full withdrawal of prednisolone, there was no difference in insulin sensitivity between those persons treated with five milligrams a day of prednisolone and not using it at all. So we have made in our national protocol uh, the statement that we taper all the patients down to five milligrams per day and we they stay there. And we have sort of some experimental data that that works to prevent them from rejections in a good way. But uh, that practice may vary between different centers, at least in Europe. In Australia and Melbourne, uh, they found out that if they split the dose of prednisolone, actually at least a high dose of prednisolone, 20 milligrams a day from only giving it in the morning, which is seen on the upper panel here, as opposed to giving 10 milligrams morning and evening, you could sort of flatten out the hyperglycemia curve. And that may be a beneficial in terms of high doses of prednisolone. The lower panel just shows the two curves, two curves superimposed on each other. That is also probably why if you use prednisolone as rather high doses in the morning, it is, it is reported in several papers uh, that has been published that the highest glucose levels will be seen in the afternoon. And that's probably because you have this prednisolone dose in the morning. And some would say that if you use glucose measurements in the afternoon, that would sort of signal the patient who is most risk for having actually PTDM and you should look into it maybe with an oral glucose tolerance test. But to straighten out the curve, at least in those with hyperglycemic tendencies, it may be worthwhile considering split the dose if it's high enough for prednisolone. That's a good advice. Then uh, eventually, just a few years ago, we got one study saying that if you took your renal transplant patients with PTDM and studied them at least six months after transplantation, and the PTDM patients were all using tacrolimus. If you randomize them to either continue with tacrolimus or switch half of them to cyclosporin A, you could see this picture one year afterwards. That it actually was much less patients with diabetes PTDM if they use cyclosporin A. This is a percentage free of PTDM one year after randomizations to either cyclosporin A or tacrolimus. And this tendency is both pronounced in those who did not use any oral agents or insulin to begin with, but you can see the signal as well in those few who were on active glucose loading treatment as well. So this has sort of made a notion that it's worthwhile considering cyclosporin A rather than tacrolimus, at least in those patients who are at risk pre-transplant. Maybe they, are, they have impaired glucose tolerance pre-transplant, at least in our center, we have taken this knowledge into selecting who is going to get cyclosporin as the main calcineurin inhibitor, as opposed to tacrolimus after transplantation. This, of course, is dependent on the immunological risk of the patient, but if it's a rather standard small immunological risk, we would tend to use cyclosporin rather than tacrolimus in those who look predisposed to develop diabetes after transplantation. Beta cell rest, can that prevent diabetes later on? We had some signals of that for type 2 diabetes, and you remember the Austrian report, a pilot study back in 2012, randomizing 20, 50 patients to either 
insulin treatment early on after transplantation versus leaving it to see what happens and then treat diabetes when it occurred. Now we have the results from a multi-center study, study that wanted to confirm this, this principle, this concept that giving early insulin treatment after transplantation, kidney transplantation may prevent the patients to have PTDM one year afterwards. So this is a study by Elisabeth Schweiger and her co-workers in Austria. It's a multi-center study with participants from not only Austria, from Germany, Italy, Spain, and the United States. They studied all together 266 persons randomized to either intensive or actually just insulin treatment early after kidney transplantation, regardless of the blood sugars, and compared that to those who could just follow conventional treatment and just treat diabetes when it occurred. Now, they say in the paper, and it's probably true, there was a problem with adherence to the protocol. So there was some protocol violation in the study. So the primary endpoint, which was uh, occurrence of PTDM after, one year after transplantation, did not turn out to be significant, and significant in the attention to treat group. But if it took out those cases who were actually violated according to protocol, that could be patients who were not sufficiently treated with insulin, and that could be patients who were on insulin one year afterwards, despite normal blood sugars. So there was some non-adherence to the to researchers at the individual centers. If you just did the per protocol analysis, there was, of course, a significant reduction in the occurrence of PTDM. Uh, one year after transplantation in those patients who were treated with insulin and the insulin in this case was uh, long acting insulin over the first few weeks. So the concept may still be valid, but the authors conclude and rightfully enough that further studies are needed to be sure that this is really a proof of concept because you had this problem with the intention to treat analysis and the primary endpoint that it should be analyzed according to. Now I'm going to use the last few minutes of my talk to the present situation, how to treat with glucose lowering agents in those who develop PTDM. This is just a, a, an old picture from Stephen Kahn and co-workers published in Lancet in 2014, uh, showing the timeline of the different uh, medications for lowering glucose in type two diabetes. And you can see that after 1990, 95, it has really exploded in all these agents that we now tend to use. My personal opinion is to say, and I think many will agree with me in saying that we could sort of know this, this toolbox, this very large extensive toolbox, but you cannot sort of use algorithms for managing type 2 diabetes direct, directly into the uh, solid organ transplant population. You need studies on these patients to confirm that not only that it works, but also that it's safe. So anyway, even if you try to use these drugs also in PTDM patients, it should be individualized to the individual patients and you should be certain about avoiding untoward side effects, especially hypoglycemic events in fragile patients. So uh, this is sort of the things that you need to be aware of. Metformin has been the baseline therapy for type 2 diabetes since 1960s, I guess. It has been advocated that this should be used also as a primary glucose lowering agent in PTDM, but I have to tell you the evidence for this is more opinion based, the evidence is not there. There is a small study that was published from Auckland in New Zealand, Helen Pilmer's group, a couple of years ago. They found 19 IGT patients, impaired glucose tolerant patients out of more than 200 transplanted patients. And they treated 10 of them with metformin, 500 milligrams two times daily versus standard care. And you can see at least for HbA1c and the same was the case for, uh, for fasting glucose. There was not much difference, but this was a small study, a pilot study, and it didn't say anything about the efficiency of the drug in these patients. And no adverse events were reported for these patients after 12 months, but then this is at best a pilot study that we cannot conclude from. Uh, 
There are not very many other reports on using metformin in these patients. These are most, the other studies are mostly case reports, retrospective case reports that cannot be relied on actually. So in my opinion, metformin has not a natural place in the treatment of PTDM patients, but I know there are centers who like to use it and we can discuss whether this should be implemented or not, but we prefer at least in Norway not to use them. Instead, we know that several studies have been performed on DPP-4 inhibitors, which has turned out to be safe, even in randomized studies. So DPP-4 inhibitors, at least citagliptin, bildagliptin, and linagliptin have been safe to use in PTDM patients. But the focus now, of course, is on the new agents that have turned out to be not only glucose-lowering agents, but also cardioprotective and renoprotective agents, even in patients without diabetes. So let's take a closer look at that before we summarize. First of all, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. We were all impressed by, for instance, the sustained six study with the semaglutide in type two diabetes patients, more than 2000 patients, actually more than 3000 patients randomized to either semaglutide or placebo over a couple of years uh, intervention study. And there was a significant difference in the composite primary end uh, endpoint of cardiovascular death, death or non-fatal myocardial fake function or non-fatal stroke. Uh, it turns out also that if you use these kind of drugs, you also get a signal out of the primary composite renal endpoint uh, consisting, of, uh, consisting of increment in proteinuria or end-stage kidney disease or death from renal events. In that case, the primary uh, component of the, renal, of the renal endpoint is the one with uh, the one with uh, proteinuria, not so much GFR, which is not uh, sort of influenced by GLP-1 receptor agonists, except for a couple of studies that may have such a signal. There are ongoing studies now looking at patients with lower GFR than 60 to see if that could be sort of a signal also in, in protecting GFR, not only preventing um, pro progression in proteinuria. As for the cardiovascular endpoint here, the major endpoint was actually, in this case, on non-fatal stroke with semaglutide, there was a signal for myocardial infarction and it was almost neutral for cardiovascular death. But I think all the GLP-1 receptor agonists will have a role in this uh, primary outcome, at least in type 2 diabetes patients, and it's used now in most algorithms around the world. We have shown in an experimental study that if we do a continuous LP GLP-1 infusion in patients with hyperglycemia during a hyperglycemic clamp, and these were both control persons and PTDM persons, you see that to begin with, the patients will have an impaired first phase insulin release, a compensatory increase in second phase insulin release, and hyperglucogenemia. If you give a continuous GLP-1 infusion, you sort of re-establish at least partly the first phase insulin release and you lower the plasma glucagon. So the concept of regulating insulin release and suppressing glucagon works also in PTDM patients, not only in type 2 diabetes. However, up to now, there are mostly case control studies that have been published, primarily with liraglutide, dulaglutide, and these are sort of not very big in large in scale. They all show us that the drug is able to reduce glucose. You get a big brood HbA1c, and you also reduce body weight in these patients. So it works the same way in that way as in PTDM, but we really need randomized controlled trials to have this established as a valid treatment. But we all have experience in using GLP-1 receptor agonists in our patients, and it seems to work at least in selected patients. Uh, Hido Herspink actually published the DIPA CKD study on the behalf of the DIPA CKD uh, group uh, back uh, one year back in time, and he could show us that DIPA glyphosate actually, as we know by um, intra intrarenal mechanisms, lower the interglomerular pre pre pressure and filtration pressure, and you get a preservation of GFR over time as opposed to placebo. 
Could this be an option also in PTDM patients? Well, there are some case control studies. We did a small pilot randomized trial that you can see here. There was a review a year ago saying that it should be, it, it looks pretty safe in these patients, but it's not very efficient to lower glucose. Altogether, I have found now nine studies involving 158 patients being treated with SGT2 inhibitors in the literature. One of them was a small randomized control trial I showed you. The rest is case reports. Uh, I had to apologize for a little bit of a blurred picture, but what you can see from the studies that I have summed up so far using SGLT2 inhibitors, most of them were case control studies, only this small one was a small randomized control trial. They tend to lower HbA1c, but not very much. It mostly depends on the baseline HbA1c to begin with. They have a sort of a weight lowering effect, also a slight blood pressure lowering effect, no special report on change in albuminuria, I must say. And happily enough, uh, although these are small studies, the signal of urinary tract infection or candida infections, in general, the candida infections does not seem to be increased with this kind of drug in the PTDM population. One could feel that, but it does not seem to be the case. The first report on using an SGLT2 inhibitor in PDM patients was the one from Austria, looking at 14 patients, PTDM patients treated with insulin. And they converted these to empagliflozin and found out that insulin was more efficient than uh, than insulin, uh, excuse me, insulin was more efficient than empagliflozin, but there was no signal of adverse effects especially not an increase, uh, um, increased occurrence of urinary tract infections. We could see the same in a small randomized trial that we did, 44 patients randomized either to empagliflozin or placebo, studied for 24 weeks. Only a marginal reduction in HbA1c, a difference between placebo or 0.5% points, but I have to emphasize that the baseline HbA1c here was pretty much normal, about seven. If you have a baseline HbA1c above eight, you usually see a larger decrease in HbA1c comparable to other oral agents. So it all depends also on the baseline HbA1c. What we could see also was of course that the change in HbA1c was largely dependent on the GFR in the patient. So you don't have much effect on the HbA1c if GFR is less than 50. And that corresponds to how much glucose, glucose you excrete in the ur urinary glucose excretion, of course. If you have a high GFR, you have a high excretion of glucose. So today, we don't have any firm conclusions on which oral glucose lowering agents to use. There are case reports and small RCTs in those that I have shown on top here. Uh, but as for metformin, GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are only case reports. Should we use GLP-1 receptor agonists or else GLT-2 inhibitors or not? Well, so far, I don't have very many safety concerns. One should exclude patients with repeated urinary tract infections before you start with SGLT2 inhibitors. But if you don't have a story of that, a history of that, it could be safe. We miss outcome studies. And until we have outcome studies, these agents are only glucose lowering agents. GLP-1 receptor agonist is actually very favorable to use if you have a patient to really need weight reduction. But this should be tailored on an individual basis because we don't have any firm studies saying how efficient or safe this is. You can use them at the GFR less than 50. As with SGLT2 inhibitors, they do not work glucose lowering at GFR less than 50. So this is a limitation of the drugs to use in this case. And uh, they may be used if you did it in addition to any kind of insulin-dependent glucose lowering, but they don't have a central place, I think, in the glucose lowering uh, treatment of the patients, but they may have some organ protective role if we can confirm that in outcome studies, but we do not have them yet.
So it should be discouraged in patients with recent UTIs or fungal genital infection. And if you want to look at the prospect of this thinking, you can sort of look up this very nice review that was published this year in Transplant International at Duglu and co-workers. They are speculating on some of these things that I've been talking about. So the conclusion is, my meaning is that PTM is still established by an OGDT. Lower doses of corticosteroids and switch from tacrolimus to cyclosporin may be an option, at least in patients with an early uh, PTDM or impaired glucose tolerance. Recommendation on using hypoglycemic agents should be based on studies in PTDM patients, not only on studies in type 2 diabetes patients. The role of GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors for cardioprotection or renal protection for that case needs badly to be studied. I would say badly. We really need these studies. Until then, glucose lowering treatment should be tailored for the individual patients with regards to obesity, age, and frailty. So we are moving away from treating a diagnosis. We are actually treating individuals. And that is very important to, to emphasize. We are treating individuals with PTDM. We are not treating PTDM. We are treating individuals with PTDM. By that, I want to thank you for listening to me, and I'm looking forward to comments from the panel and, and also questions from the listeners. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jensen, um, for your excellent talk, taking us from the diagnosis to the treatment of PTDM. So maybe we should move uh, to our panelists. Um, Matt, if you maybe have any special comments on the talk? Any special yeah. issues? Thanks, uh, Tron, for an excellent speak. Um, I have uh, two comments. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that there is a badly need for, for uh, glucose lowering uh, agents. Um, the, the model agent for this kind of uh, treatment should decrease uh, weight or at least not increase weight. And also uh, maybe have an, an, an influence on appetite uh, and, and also on, on, uh, on the glucose uh, potential, glucose lowering potential. Do you see any preference of these drugs in case of uh, this, uh, this uh, model drug? And do you see a preference for a drug that actually helps the beta cell not only to, to maybe rest, but also uh, improve uh, when you have a patient that actually gets a drug that decreases insulin secretion. Uh, thank you for your comment and question, Mats. Uh, I take your point. And um, as we alluded to, if you have a real overweight patient, I think it would be very nice. And that is the case with type 2 diabetes patients. The modern way of looking at it is to to have them lose weight. So a GLP-1 receptor agonist would be an ideal tool to help that on the way. Uh, that does not say that SGLT2 inhibitors could not be of a useful tool as well. It's, it's paradoxical that we do not have very many studies combining the two classes of instruments. We don't have many studies in type 2 diabetes patients combining GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, but the few that has the few that has have reported on this show excellent results as well. So maybe a GLP-1 receptor agonist would be very nice to in not only regulate uh, glucose and impair glucagon release, but to have the patient reduce weight. Maybe also an SGLT2 inhibitors could work on the sideline to to have the patient uh, have a less insulin need in terms of a non-insulin dependent pathway for removing glucose. But then again, the main reason for using these drugs in the future would be to look if they are cardio or renal protective or not. I'm looking forward to these studies because we know that already in all other patients. It's very not, our patients deserve to have these studies performed. Uh, PTDM patients should not be held outside a good common treatment for diabetes. Great. If I may, uh, maybe just to ask a question from the audience that is connected to this is, are there any studies regarding the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists on, in patients on waiting lists, maybe? I'm not sure, uh, sure of that, but maybe Mots can answer it. <laughs> 
because we know that uh, the, pro the producer, the drug producer doesn't recommend to use the drug, uh, for example, uh, on, uh, with the end-stage renal disease. So what's your clinical experience and uh, do, do what's you your ask yeah, do you ask about the GLP-1 agonist? GLP-1, yes. Yeah, well, well we have uh, performed some uh, small studies uh, in dialysis patients with the GLP-1 agonist, and, and they worked uh, quite well in comparison to uh, type 2 diabetic patients uh, with uh, normal renal function. Mm. Uh, they, they needed to be slower titrated, and we published that in diabetes care. Uh, Thomas Edor made those studies. Um, but... Uh, so, so I'm not afraid of, of, of giving it to people uh, with uh, no renal function. Uh, I'm more worried about how it influences the, the immune suppression after transplantation. And those studies uh, have not been performed uh, uh, in my, in my uh, as, as, as well as, as, as I know about. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's some of the studies that we uh, really desperate need to do and also need to do in the context of actually that this uh, semaglutide is coming in an oral formulation. So we now have the opportunity, uh, with, uh, hopefully soon, to start a new study with the oral formulation of the drug instead of giving it as injection. This is, I think, this is a, a potential uh, new uh, solution. If I could, could yes. add on to, to your comment, Zenko, with reference to the studies that have been performed that have been performed in Copenhagen, we have on an individual basis actually treated some of our patients on the waiting list or before they enter the waiting links with liraglutide, for instance, just to have them lose weight. For our researchers, we not allow patients to be transplanted unless they have a BMI less than 33. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree, and if I may comment, we, we have had the discussion also in, the, in our sensor and also actually in Denmark, what to do with these patients. And on an individual basis, we do actually consult with our endocrinologist, and we also make a very uh, thorough uh, evaluation of the patients uh, regarding the cardiovascular risk file and also the weight profile uh, to see if they can actually uh, benefit from uh, GLP-1 uh, agonist uh, treatment, and we, we do treat this the Esteban, you wanted to comment something. Yes, I, I, well, well, thank you, Tron, for this wonderful talk, uh, as, as, as usual. I, I think that regarding the comments on the drugs, there, there are some aspects that uh, could be interesting to, to consider for future studies. That if you have time in the waiting list, you can treat patients to eliminate some risk factors mainly obesity, pre-diabetes, etc. We, we have been doing studies with OGTTs in the waiting list, and many of them are obese. And it will be just a comment for the future. To, if you have time, because you pay the patient will be one year, one year and a half, I don't know the average time on the waiting list in Europe, but at least in Spain, it's about one year. So you may have some time, or even when you start in pre-dialysis, because in pre-dialysis, you know that the patient is going to go into dialysis and already has metabolic syndrome. It would be wonderful to start some kind of drug study or a, 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 another aspect that is exercise. Exercise may improve many of these factors. We are currently doing uh, a study on pre-diabetic patients after transplantation with exercise, and exercise is revert, reverting pre-diabetes. Is cheap because it is not a drug, but logistically it's very complex from a logistical point of view. I, I want just to, to, to ask Tron what do you, you think about that because it's something that eliminating the risk of patient in the waiting list and on follow up after transplantation could be interesting. Just drugs or exercise, not necessarily. You can give some drug to patient with pre diabetes and try to reverse. What do you think? I think Esteban is a very good point. Um, a major contribution factor for developing hyperglycemia, PTM after transplantation is actually the metabolic syndrome before you enter transplantation. And uh, if your center, your group has also published that uh, 
uh, the metabolic syndrome may actually be a driving force in the interplay with tacrolimus, uh, the diabetogenic effect with tacrolimus. So if you can re eliminate some of these factors prior to transplantation, life will be much more easy afterwards because after transplantation, you are fighting with side effects with the immunosuppressive drugs. You are fighting with um, surgic issues that may remain for weeks after transplantation. So you could do a lot of sound work prior to transplantation to avoid um, avoid a glycemic load afterwards, I think. And when we talk about pre preventing PTDM, it's not a question of keeping the blood sugar low. What actually is a risk of PTDM is not the blood sugar, but it's all the things that come with it. Hypercholesterolemia, yeah. uh, hypertrichosemia, blood pressure, body weight, and everything. That is sort of the main thing of the whole, it's a whole package. So what you're talking about is reducing the package, and I agree with you. Yeah. And uh, in this sense, I think it's very interesting, these uh, newer drugs, for example, uh, inhibitors of the SGLT2, um, I mean, they could be used also in this pre-diabetic phase in uh, patients with um, after transplantation. Uh, and uh, in this way, we could really offer them um, cardiovascular protection. What do you think? I mean, even before they develop PTDM. You are talking about using them early on after transplantation, Josenko? Yes. Yeah, I think you are, it's a good point. The thing is, as Mots also alluded to, we don't have many safety studies on these drugs early after transportation. Actually, we have none. Um, the studies that we have seen with SGLT2 inhibitors and GLPN receptor agonists have mainly been half at least one year after transportation. And I know the drug companies are very reluctant to run into these studies because they fear they get some serious side effects that they haven't seen before, and they may sort of destroy the nice results that they have from type 2 diabetes studies. So they are sort of reluctant, but they are moving into the discussion right now. Uh, I'm personally discussing with companies about SGLT2 inhibitors, and no much is discussing about GLP-1 receptor agonists. So we, we need these early on studies to know that they are safe. But... The concept you are mentioning sounds very reasonable. If they are safe, they could be nice to use early on. Yes, but I think um, it would be really interesting to hear from the audience what is their uh, primary choice or the most common choice for treating uh, PTDM in their countries. Uh, I think a lot of us are staying with insulin, sulfonylureas, and, you know, I think on one hand, we are really afraid of possible side effects um, in the sense of primum non serre, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we are not so aware of um, the benefits we might withheld with this, uh, with this approach to our patients in the long term. So... Mm. There is a question from, uh, yes. from Bente Jespersen in uh, Aarhus, uh, who says, why have studies not been, uh, been done in, on metformin, cheap drug that could facilitate uh, a weight loss? Um, if I could comment on that, uh, because yes, uh, um, I, I agree that uh, this, this would be preferable that we had these studies. Um, uh, I know that uh, some of my colleagues uh, in Bendis uh, Hospital has uh, advocated that that metformin is uh, is uh, quite safe to use based on observational studies, like the Stephen study uh, in 2014 from uh, Kasiski's group, where they showed in 4,000 patients that uh, metformin was uh, safe to use uh, with a GFR above uh, 30. Um, this was uh, maybe biased by uh, younger patients uh, in that cohort uh, that are actually were the patients uh, that was uh, uh, the, the average uh, group of the treatment. And uh, I could uh, uh, counter argue that uh, if you treat patients, uh, patients with metformin, uh, maybe increase the cardiovascular risk profile, you risk, uh, you risk uh, giving them um, uh, side effects uh, uh, that are, uh, are really uh, uh, hard uh, when you are an older patient like lactic acidosis. Uh, and I, I, I'm afraid of these uh, side effects. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, one of the main arguments for using metformin is the price. Uh, 
is a very cheap drug. Some years ago, we tried to actually make uh, a multi-center European study on metformin with the efficacy and, and, uh, and safety endpoint. Uh, a lot of very uh, 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 well uh, uh, characterized patients were to be a part of this study and no one wanted to, uh, to finance this study. So um, it's, it's, it's sometimes, I think it has to be a trade on what is actually safe and what is working. On the other hand, what would be the preferable drug, a cheap drug, of course. So I don't have the answer. I just say, I, I'm worried about giving a metformin to older patients and especially a cardiovascular risk profile patients. Yes, we desperately need studies, a lot of studies. Uh, Esteban, maybe, is there any other points you maybe want to stress with this? Uh, I think that the, the trend covered the, the, the most major consequences of the disease. So cardiovascular events and infectious diseases that are related to diabetes, like in the general population. Just, I think, just a comment uh, that Diabetes in the general population is related to several types of cancer. Breast cancer, endometrium, colon, um, sometimes. I think that, uh, that this is the other part we need to evaluate in this study. We, we are working on that. We're trying to figure out what, what happens because cancer, we need not to forget that it's very frequent. And if it is that frequent in the in the renal transfer population, and PTDM is very frequent in the renal transfer population. Perhaps the links, there is something there. I think, I don't know if that it was not investigated before, as far as I know, but we, we are trying to work on that. And I think it is an interesting point for the future. I don't know what, what you both think. A very good point, Professor Jensen. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, you cannot, so, you know that diabetes is sort of associated with at least certain kinds of cancer and malignant diseases. Uh, we also know that uh, solid organ transplant patients are sort of running into risk just by the transplantation and the use of immunosuppressive therapy. What we do not know is how diabetes add on to the risk of on top of the immunosuppressive agents. So it's a very fair question. So we cannot really conclude from experiences in the non-transplant patient uh, population. So that study probably through registries would be a way to start. And you are doing that, Esteban, that's very, very rewarding. And I hope to do the same thing with our registries too. It would be nice also to combine data sets because we need a lot, you need a lot of time uh, to, to, to find uh, to find some 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 things related. Yeah. So that's good. Okay. So I, I just have a comment. Uh, we had a we had a question uh, actually before the presentation about how to use HbA1c as a as a as a indicator of uh, of uh, PTDM and also monitoring of PTDM. Um, and uh, this uh, could actually lead to the, to the, to the uh, co-question, do we need other measures to, to monitor these patients uh, like uh, glucose, uh, continuous glucose monitoring uh, uh, devices that they actually are, are getting quite easy to use and has been shown to, to actually be uh, uh, a valuable tool to, uh, to decrease the variability of uh, PTDM. How, how is your opinion about uh, first HbA1c and also the, the technique, uh, Tron? Well, the reason for using HbA1c in type 2 diabetes patients was, of course, uh, the simplicity. You don't need to do it fasting. It's very reproducible, and the assays are very correct, uh, very accurate. Uh, so I agree that it would be very helpful if we could use HBA will see as a diagnostic criterion also in, in PTDM patients. Uh, my way of thinking is that the, the whole concept about PTDM was not the blood sugar, sugar itself, but the cardiovascular risk and the mortality risk. And you really had to show that you have the same association with HBA1C before you want to use it across the board. Uh, we don't have that data yet, but we were ha very happy to use HbA1c as a diagnostic criterion, let's say one year after transplantation and see how that works 10 years down the road. 
that would be of interest to, interest to see. I don't know, Esteban, if you had the data from your large database. You looked at HP1C and you repeated OGDT studies. Uh, yes, I, I don't want to, to say a lie, but I think that it was HB1C was not that strongly associated, like the, the idea of being or not being predated. Because there was many of, basically because many of these values are, were, were quite low. Because, you know, you treat these PTDM patients very early, this is strange at least to find a nine or 12 or 11, or like 18 hemoglobin. And many of the pre-diabetic patients have very low levels. The, the range was narrow. I think this is was, but I, I, I will, this is the idea I, I have. I will, I could, would need, could need to recheck re, re that. Well, what, what is for sure is that the two criteria, we have studied that and published that, they define totally different uh, populations, at least one year after transplantation. If you look at pie charts or PTDM diagnosis with the OGDT criterion and the HP1C, these are different populations, just a very small overlap. Mm -hmm. So we really need to be cautious about translating diagnosis from one criterion to another. We have to have long follow-up studies to be sure that we are doing the right thing, I think. Yeah. Okay, unfortunately, we came to an end of our meeting. I would like to uh, really thank to the speakers for coming and sharing your knowledge with us, and also to the audience to sending in the questions. I hope it was a pleasant meeting for you all, and a good opportunity to share uh, knowledge. So. Um, I would like to um, remind you that by participating live, participants earn one European credit for continuous medical education. And the next uh, working group e-seminar titled The New ESPEN Guidelines on Clinical Nutrition for Hospitalized Patients with Kidney Disease is scheduled on December 14. You're all very welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, have a nice December. Bye. Bye now. Thank you very much.